Hi, this is Simon Upstall, and welcome to another tutorial for Blackmagic Fusion. And today we're going to be taking a look at the technique of frequency separation retouching. And as part of that, we'll also be finding out how to build our own 3D Kia. Now, if you're a Resolve user, you'll wonder why you'd ever want to know about this stuff, given that Resolve has a very powerful retouching toolset that makes all of this very easy for you. But as with many of my tutorials, what I want to share with you is an understanding of the underlying principles of this technique at a basic level. Because knowing about the mechanics of how our tools work is very useful for helping us to use them better. Now in this tutorial, as so often, I'm going to be using the custom tool quite a bit. And if you're not familiar with that, please do check out my in-depth tutorial on that subject. And I've put that link in the comments. So for this tutorial, I'm going to be using this shot, very kindly supplied to me by my friend Sebastian Matthias Weisbach. Sebastian is a very talented short filmmaker, and I'd seriously recommend you check out his latest piece, which I'll link to in the comments. So first of all, a few words about how frequency separation works. It sounds pretty fancy, but it's really not at all complicated. We use a low frequency pass to blend together the imperfections in our image, and then we use a high frequency pass to restore some of the details. Now, the low frequency pass is a really simple operation. It's just a straight blur. But given that we only want to blur the areas of skin and not the whole image, we need to set up a key to isolate the skin from everything else. Now we could do that by grabbing the chroma key here and piping our image into that. Then we'd select the areas we wanted in the key, like so. But what you'll notice is that this gives us edges to the key that are pretty choppy. And as we play through the result, you can see that those choppy edges are pretty noisy and that will give us problems later on. That's not to say we can't make this type of key work, but we're going to need a lot of blur, and even that might not be enough to disguise that temporal noise. So, let's look at a different approach. We're going to build ourselves a 3D keyer that hopefully gives us a much smoother result. So, what is a 3D keyer? To understand it a bit better, I want you to take a look at this 3D cube. Now, I've made this an 8x8x8 cube for visual simplicity, but in reality, your images will have a lot more steps depending on their bit depth. So, for example, an 8-bit image will require a cube that's 256 by 256 by 256 and so on. Being a cube, it has three axes, X, Y and Z, and we can map each of those axes to red, green and blue. So here's what it looks like if I map the x-axis to red. As we go from left to right, we go from black, which is the same as a zero value for red, to a value of 1 on the right, in other words, 100% red. Now let's map the y-axis to green. So now our bottom left-hand row is still black, where both values are zero but the top left row is now 100% green, and the top right row is 100% yellow, because we're mixing 100% red with 100% green. So finally, let's map the z-axis to blue. Our far corner at the back here is still black, but this corner at the front right top is white, because we're mixing 100% of each colour into it. Our front left bottom corner is blue, and our front right bottom corner is magenta, and so on. So now you can see, hopefully, that we can define every possible colour depending on its position within this 3D cube. In other words, every possible colour has its own XYZ coordinates in 3D space. So the reason I needed to show you that is because when we're calculating a 3D key, what we're going to be doing is calculating the distance in 3D space 
between two different pixel values, namely the pixel value of our key color and the value of each individual pixel within our image. If the two pixels occupy the exact same position in 3D space, our calculation will return a value of zero, in other words, black. And conversely, the further away the two pixels are in value, the more the calculation will return a value closer to white. And that's how we get our key. So let's see how that works in terms of the maths. And for that, I'm going to add a custom tool after my image, and I'm going to pipe the output of that into a bitmap tool. The bitmap tool will take a single channel output from our custom tool and return a three channel grayscale image with additional controls that lets us easily fine tune the result. So it's a useful thing to use here. And because the bitmap tool defaults to using the alpha channel as its input, I'm going to use the alpha expression field of the custom tool to generate our 3D Kia algorithm. But first, I need to add a background tool and pipe that into the secondary input of our custom tool. So now, to calculate the 3D distance between our reference color and our foreground pixel color, for each of our three channels, we need to subtract the background value from the foreground value and take the square of the result. Then we'll add those three results together and take the square root of the total. And then we'll invert it. So in my alpha expression field, I'm going to type one minus square root, that's S-Q-R-T, open brackets, open brackets, R1 minus R2, close brackets, to the power of two, plus, open brackets, G1 minus G2, close brackets, again, to the power of two, plus, open brackets, B1 minus B2, close brackets, to the power of two, close brackets. Now let's look at the output of our bitmap tool, and I'm going to make an adjustment to my low value here to bring it up to around 0.5. And then let's come over to our background reference color. And now all I need to do is make a pick of my foreground skin tone to get me roughly in the ballpark. And then I can use the color controls to fine tune the hue, saturation and value till I've isolated the skin areas that I want. Now you'll notice that because the lips have a lot of red in them, as does the skin itself, we haven't been able to completely separate them out. But there's an easy way of dealing with that. I'm going to add a hue curves tool to the output of my foreground image. And we're going to uncheck saturation and enable luminance. And I'm just going to grab this end red keyframe and I'll reduce the value down till I start to exclude the lips because of course they're darker than the skin. And then I'm just going to bring this other keyframe over a little bit to isolate them a bit more. Now I can come back to my bitmap tool and adjust the white value to solidify the result. And as you can see, we've got a very clean key that has none of the choppiness of the chroma key result we were looking at earlier. The problem with Fusion's Chroma Kia, and it's the same whether you're using chroma or color, is that it uses a thresholding technique to simplify the matte creation, but that's actually undesirable. So I'm showing you the Fusion Chroma Kia over here on the left, and our homegrown version is over here on the right for comparison. In the Fusion Chroma Kia, everything above the threshold gets pushed all the way up to white, and everything below it gets pushed all the way down to black, and that means that the edges of the key will always be extremely harsh, with literally no softness whatsoever. The only way of introducing some softness is to blur the result, but that's a poor option because we've lost any of the softness of the original image. By contrast, our homemade method isn't using this threshold technique, and we have complete control over how much softness we want to keep. 
and that will always make for a much better key. So now that's done, we can use this as a mask for our low frequency pass. So the next step is to add a blur tool. And then I'm going to pipe my foreground into that. And then I'm going to pipe the output of the bitmap tool into the effect mask input of the blur tool. Let's have a look at the output of the blur tool and let's adjust our blur value till we've got something that smooths out most of the imperfections in the skin. So somewhere around 10 is probably about right in this case. Now, as I mentioned, this is just the first half of the frequency separation process, and we now need to add back in the high frequency detail. So to do that, I'm going to add another custom tool and pipe my foreground image directly into it. I'm also going to add another blur tool into which I'll again pipe my foreground image. And then I'll pipe the output of that into the image to input of the custom tool. I'm going to set the blur value to three, but this is something we can come back and fine tune as required. It wants to be quite a low value though. So in my custom tool, I want to subtract the blurred input from the unblurred input for each channel. And then we want to offset the result so that the black values are raised up to mid gray. So to do that, I'm going to enter C1 minus C2 plus 0.5 into the red expression field. And then I'm going to copy and paste that into the other two channels. So this is now our high frequency image. And the reason we need our black values to be at mid gray is that we're going to be using the linear light blend mode to composite this over our low frequency result. So the problem with fusion is that it doesn't have the linear light blend mode as standard, and we're going to have to build our own version. But that's not difficult at all. We're going to be adding another custom tool, and then we're going to use the low frequency result as our image one input, and our high frequency pass as our image two input. Then to create our linear light blend mode, I'm going to type the following into the red expression field. C1 plus two times C2 minus one. And I'm going to copy that into the other two color channels. And now let's look at the result. And as you can see, we've now reintroduced the high frequency detail, which restores the sharpness and definition to the image and stops the skin itself from looking plasticky. So if we compare that with our original over on the left, you can see that's not a bad job. I'm just going to come back to the blur that we were using for the high frequency pass and show you the effect of adjusting that blur value. You can see that if I increase it too much, the detail gets very coarse. But as I get back towards zero, it starts to disappear altogether. So it's really a question of finding the right balance that works best for your shot. Just to come back to the linear light blend mode for a second, I want to explain what this process does. Now, linear light is one of a group of blend modes that include overlay, soft light, hard light, and so on. And what they have in common is that they use one blend method for pixels above mid gray and another for those below it. Linear light uses the linear dodge method for the higher values and linear burn for the lower values. You'll remember that we offset the high frequency results by 0.5, and the point of that was to take advantage of how linear light handles values above and below this threshold. Where the foreground is darker than the high frequency pass, the values get added together and brightened. Where the foreground is brighter, there is a slight darkening effect. So that's about it for this tutorial. I hope you found that interesting. 
As I mentioned at the start, you could always just use the built-in tools in Resolve to do something identical. Personally, I usually find the extra flexibility you get from building the effect in Fusion gives you a bit more control over the fine details, because it's much easier to isolate individual areas for separate treatment, and you can end up with a much more refined result. So, thanks very much for watching, and I hope to see you again another time.